Okay, so you've told me that I've got Gleason 3 plus 4 um, prostate cancer. What does that mean? Prostate cancer's grade is out of 10. So 10 out of 10 is the worst prostate cancer you can have, and 6 out of 10 is the, the best prostate cancer you can have, and that system's called a Gleason score mm. system. It's quite a complicated system, but if I just go through it in a bit of detail, because that will help you understand why we sometimes suggest let's do this or let's do this. The, the score out of 10 is actually made up of two grades of prostate cancer scored out of five. And the first grade, when they look at all your biopsies, they say this is the most common area of cancer that you've got. And they give that a score of three, four or five. And then the uh, second number in your score is the second most common bit of cancer you've got. And that gets three, four or five. And these are added together to give you a score out of 10. And you've got three plus four prostate cancer, which means that three is the main uh, element and four is the secondary element. And the reason that we put a lot of emphasis on this is that we know that biologically three cancer tends not to spread. Um, it can do, but much less commonly, whereas four and five cancer um, can spread. Uh, so in a way, that's the bit we're, we're worried about. So although someone could have six, seven, eight, nine or ten, we think of six really in one group and everything else in another group because it has to have some bit of four or, or worse. Is it really? I mean, you're saying if most of my cancer is Gleason 3, so the, the least aggressive type, does that still mean that I need treatment? A lot of Gleason 3 plus 3 prostate cancer would just go onto active surveillance and we just watch that. Mm -hmm. And some Gleason 3 plus 4 prostate cancer would go onto active surveillance. Um, and, but really, when we make that decision, there's a few factors involved as to whether we say, no, look, you should have more radical treatment or you can have active surveillance. If I just tell you a little bit about active surveillance to start with, the advantages are that if we don't do anything radical to you, you can't have the side effects of radical treatment. And we can talk about those in a minute. So, uh, but it, it, that's good to avoid those. The disadvantage is that if we don't do something bigger, we might miss, miss the boat. Um, now, people with Gleason 3 plus 3 prostate cancer, we're pretty happy to go onto active surveillance. But once you start getting higher than that, then we're a little bit more, more uneasy. Okay, so when I'm trying to decide between potentially active surveillance or treatment for this Gleason 3 plus 4 prostate cancer, are there any... Um, factors that I should weigh up when trying to make that decision? Yeah, so as I said to you, really it's the, the four bit that we're most worried about. So we, we really want to know how much four there, there is. Mm -hmm. So we've, we firstly look at the number of cores that you had out of, uh, in your biopsies that were positive. Mm -hmm. So we typically take 12 cores, something like that, and we look, you know, is it most of those cores positive? Is it just one core positive? So that gives us a bit of an idea of the volume of cancer. The second thing that the pathologists tell us is that when the, the biopsies come out, they're about the width of a pencil lead, um, and they're maybe a couple of centimetres long, and, and the pathologists look at that and they say, uh, how much of that pencil lead effectively was cancerous. So it's 5%, 50%, 100%. So that also gives us an idea of how much cancer there is there. And your 3 plus 4, so, which means that 3 is the commonest area, so we would look at what the split is. So some people at 3 plus 4, 95% 3, 5% 4. Um, others would be 55, 45 right. split. So... If someone had a very small volume of cancer, maybe one or two cores, and the, the four element was a very, very minor amount of the three plus four, we w might consider active surveillance on them. If you've got more cancer, and certainly if you've got bigger volumes of four, then we would be much more inclined to go for um, more radical treatment. So... If I had at least some 4 plus 3 rather than 3 plus 4, would that make any difference to me? Yeah, almost certainly, really, I mean, because that means that the 4 is the primary grade of your cancer, so it's, it's more 4 than 3. So that would definitely give us a, a much more of a nudge towards more radical uh, treatment. And the other factors I think we would take into account, 
you know, when we're deciding should someone in your sort of three plus four, four plus three scenario go for radical treatment, would be things like strong family history of cancer. That would be, make us more likely to go for something more radical. Certain ethnic groups do have a higher instance uh, and do tend to do worse like for like. So people of Afro-Caribbean heritage. Um, so these are all factors that would nudge us a bit towards. And what, what active treatment options are there available for me? The main ones are surgery or radiotherapy. Um, radiotherapy is done by shining the rays at you, that's called external beam uh, radiotherapy, or by putting in radioactive seeds, that's called prostate brachytherapy. If I just talk about surgery, first of all, that's done by, um, well here, since 2008 or so, we've been doing it by robotic keyhole surgery. Um, the, uh, and with the surgery, the whole prostate is removed and then we join the water pipe back up to the bladder. And there's a number of advantages and disadvantages, really. So the disadvantages is that very, very occasionally people could die as a consequence of the operation, but that's maybe one in a thousand, and that would be some freak thing, like a, a clot that goes off to the lungs or a completely unexpected heart attack. Yeah. So it's really uncommon, but it's not absolutely impossible. The two things really that bother people are um, incontinence of urine and erection problems. So everyone's incontinent to start with, pretty much, uh, and then you improve over the coming uh, weeks or, or months, um, and you manage that with pads down your, down your pants, really, um, and mostly it's time that just gets people there. There are certain factors that, can in, in, that make us feel someone's incontinence might be less than, than others. So age is a big thing. You know, if, you're, if someone is getting significantly over 70, you can imagine that the pelvic floor and everything's just not as strong yeah. compared with someone who's, say, 50. Um, big prostates tend to be perhaps a little bit worse because we have to make a bigger hole in the bladder to get them out. Um, and if people are nice and skinny, that's quite good. And there are other other factors as well for incontinence. But we'd expect the vast majority of people to, get, to be completely dry. Mm. And if, if they're not dry, then there are other things we, we, we can uh, do. Um, erections are a problem. Um, and we can perhaps talk about that in a, in a minute. Um, the advantage of surgery is the prostate's out and it's gone. And some people just psychologically feel much more comfortable with that than having your prostate's still in place if you have radiotherapy. Um, but I think the really big advantage is that if you needed top-up treatment, um, then the safety net after surgery is quite good because it's very easy to give you top-up radiotherapy to the area. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you have radiotherapy first and then surgery, it's more tricky um, because the radiotherapy tends to make the tissue planes stick together mm -hmm. and, and makes would make surgery after radiotherapy a bit, bit more difficult and side effects bigger. So and that is a factor. It's complicated because we then have to weigh up, when we're advising which way to go, we sort of weigh up what are your risks of needing a safety net. Yeah. And, you know, and an older person with less nasty cancer, you're not likely to need that safety net. Mm. Whereas a very young person with really aggressive cancer, it's certainly a factor in our consideration really. I mean, sexual function is quite important to me. Is there anything that can be done to try and reduce the risk of that being harmed? Uh, certainly, the um, the nerves to the to the penis for erections run on the prostate, um, and they're not a um, they're like a meshwork of nerves. It's not a single cable, so you don't go, oh, cut it or haven't cut it. The it's a meshwork. So the closer we stick to the prostate, the the more of the meshwork we save, and the more likely someone is to get erections back. Um, the reason we don't just do that on everybody anyway um, is that prostate cancer mostly lives around the edge of the prostate and so if you hug very close to the prostate to save the nerves you run the risk of compromising it from a cancer side. So we, we certainly do do quite a lot of nerve sparing operations but what the factors we look at are 
you know, how important are erections to someone and everyone's different. You know, some people have just got married last week, some people it's not important for them. And we also look at the cancer. So if someone's got really very nasty cancer, then we would tend to go a bit further away from their prostate to try and get all the cancer out, but the, the erections would be compromised a bit more. Um, sometimes people have cancer on one side and not on the other side, and then we go for a full nerve spare if it's important on one side and a bit wider on the other side. Uh, most people probably would need a top-up of Viagra or something afterwards, at least in the early stages, um, but erections can recover over, even over a couple of years, really. Yeah. So what about the radiotherapy options? Yep, yep. Um, there's two main ways of uh, doing radiotherapy for us. Um, one is called prostate brachytherapy, and that's putting radioactive seeds into the prostate. And the other is shining the rays at you. That's called external beam radiotherapy. Um, with prostate brachytherapy, um, it's done under a general anaesthetic, um, and it's, it's like the reverse of a biopsy, really. So we put needles into the prostate, but instead of pulling out bits of prostate to biopsy, we put in radioactive pellets. Um, and they stay in the prostate forever. Uh, and they give out their radiation over about a year. Um, it's your home the next day. It's a very easy treatment to, to have and get through. Uh, of all the treatments, it's probably the kindest for erections. Um, at least initially, perhaps over time, erections fade a bit, but then you're getting a bit older. Um, we really need sort of two criteria to, for someone to be suitable for brachytherapy. Uh, one is their prostate needs to be an adequate size. So if it's a very, very tiny prostate, that makes brachytherapy difficult. Or if it's a massive prostate, again, that's difficult. But we can treat, a, you know, we can treat almost all prostates. Two side effects, really. One, it upsets the waterworks. So... Um, we only do brachytherapy in people whose waterworks are good enough to start with because you have to have a bit of reserve to, to get a bit worse and still have you know, good quality of life with your waterworks. So to see if someone's suitable, we'd have to do a questionnaire, uh, a flow rate test where we can see how fast you weed, and a scan of the bladder to see how well you're emptying the bladder. And if, some, if someone's good on all of those, then uh, brachytherapy... Uh, is certainly a, an option for, for 3 plus 4 cancer, maybe a little bit more than that, perhaps not the really aggressive uh, cancers. The downside of brachytherapy, uh, uh, and in fact the downside of external beam radiotherapy, which I'll tell you about in a second, is that with all radiotherapy it tends to fuse the tissue planes a little bit, make, make them a bit sticky, so if you needed top-up treatment after some form of radiotherapy, it's quite hard to go back and do surgery. It's not impossible, but it's more difficult. Well, it's not the same the other way around. So you talked about brachytherapy. What other radiotherapy options are there? External beam radiotherapy, and that's where you basically just lie down on a special bed and we fire the um, radiotherapy rays at you. Um, that's done daily, uh, usually for about four weeks, Monday to Friday for about four weeks. Um, the actual raise bit of it takes maybe 10-15 minutes, but your whole appointment's maybe an hour or so by the time you arrive and get ready and all things like that. Um, so actually going through it's fairly straight, straightforward. Most people towards the end of the course of radiotherapy start feeling a little bit tired, um, but partly that's just all the travelling in and out every day for, for a month. Um, you can get some bladder symptoms, so a bit of irritability and frequency, uh, and you can get some rectal symptoms, which are a bit of uncomfortableness, maybe some bleeding, and usually those settle, but a tiny proportion of people they, they ca carry on uh, for. Um, often the radiotherapy people, the radiotherapy department can tailor it, so if, if someone's still working, you can carry on working, and what they might try and do is give you an earlier slot in the day, so you work in the afternoon, or vice versa. Um, and that's a good option too. Okay. I mean, if I had Gleason 8, 9, or even 10 prostate cancer, would that change the treatment options for me? Uh, well, we, we wouldn't contemplate active surveillance for that. Um, and if we were to, uh, going for more radical treatment, more active treatment, it's more likely that we would go for multimodality treatment. So 
if we decided to go down the radiotherapy route, it's possible that you would have radioactive seeds and external beam radiotherapy as a double treatment. And if you had surgery, the likelihood of potentially having positive margins is higher the higher the, the overall Gleason score. So it's possible you'd have surgery, but with a higher likelihood of needing some external beam radiotherapy afterwards. You said that but sometimes my urinary symptoms or the size of my prostate might make the decision for me. Are there any other factors which would help me decide which option to go for? Um, yes, so it, in terms of cure, sometimes there's not much between all the, all the different options. So we, we, we would sort of tailor someone's advice of whether to have surgery or brachytherapy or external beam radiotherapy. Um, depending on other factors. So, for example, if someone's had five heart attacks and hugely unfit, then we're not going to go for surgery on, on that person. Um, if someone's really not interested in erections and they've got a slightly nastier cancer, that would nudge us towards surgery. If someone's having great trouble with their waterworks, that would nudge us towards surgery. Um, if someone had slightly less nasty prostate cancer and their erections were important for them and they wanted to get back to work really rapidly, that might not just towards brachytherapy. So there's lots of different things that push us one way or the other. There's not, n there's not one outstanding treatment that's clearly better for everyone than, than everyone else. And would I need any treatment before I go on to have surgery or brachytherapy or radiotherapy? If you had surgery, no. Um, if you have radiotherapy, you'd probably have some hormones beforehand. And this, would, and this would be about three months before you had the radiotherapy um, and for some time after you had the radiotherapy. Um, and how long afterwards would depend really on the grade of your cancer. So potentially just three months, but sometimes longer, 18 months, two, year, two years. And this isn't just a sort of NHS tactic to, for capacity problems and just delaying you. It's because hormones have been shown to um, sensitise the prostate to the, to the effects of radiotherapy, so the results are better. Yeah. Um, and secondly, the hormones are actually anti-cancer in their own right. So although you think, oh, I want to get on with my radiotherapy, Actually, from when you start the hormones, which we normally start people on tablets, from the moment you start them, it's anti-prostate -can anti cancer in its own right. And how will we know how successful the treatment's been? Well, you know, do I get followed up for how long? You know, what's the process? Like? Yeah, so we follow you up with PSA um, because um, now it's slightly different for surgery and radiotherapy. If you have surgery, your PSA should fall to... It's not, it's not exactly nothing, because that's the way the test goes, but it's virtually nothing. And your PSA should stay flat at that level forever. Um, if your PSA started to go up and, and certainly repeatedly went up and up and up and up, we go, hang on, this isn't right. You know, because you if you had your prostate out, you shouldn't have PSA. So if your PSA goes repeatedly up, we know there's some trouble somewhere, which would be, we worry about a spread or, or a recurrence. Um, if that, depending on the, quite when that happens, we, you probably need some extra treatment, and that may be radiotherapy to the pelvis, which is very easily done, external beam radiotherapy to the pelvis, which is very easily done. Um, and that's done in a slightly lower dose than if you had radiotherapy as your main treatment. So the side effects are actually not that bad, um, but it's just a chore to go through two, two treatments. So one of the things we look at is positive margins. When, you, when your prostate comes out, we, we look at the edges of it and say, look, is the, is the cancer all confined within the prostate or is it just coming up to the edges? And if it come, comes up to the edges, then those people sometimes do need some top-up radiotherapy, but we, we make, mostly we make that decision on what people's PSA um, is, is doing. Yeah. With radiotherapy, your PSA level will be a bit higher because you've still got some prostates in place but basically again it should still be s s effectively static um, so that's what we, what we watch for you. Yeah. Thanks very much. Thank you.